In the last lecture, we have seen the importance of energy and the contribution of fossil fuel for the energy production, energy consumption, energy utilization. In this context, we can also say that fuel is energy because fuel contains energy. Now, let us proceed further to characterize the fuel. Now, by characterization of fuel, we mean one is the analysis because we want to do some calculations say how much amount of fuel is required for a particular objective then we must know the analysis of the fuel. Another that is important from the characterization of fuel point of view is the calorific value of the fuel. calorific value of the fuel. Now, let us take first analysis of fuel. Now, under the analysis of fuel that is let me be very clear under the fuel I am meaning here solid fuel for example, coal, liquid fuel that is the fuel oil which is derived from petroleum and natural gas. So, about the analysis say if one the two types of analysis are done on solid fuel one is approximate analysis one is the approximate analysis and another is the ultimate analysis. In the approximate analysis the following are determined moisture the in short we will write m now moisture in the fuel is determined by taking 1 gram of sample it is heated in a furnace for 1 hour at 105 degree celsius in some books this temperature may vary but it doesn't matter plus minus 5 degree could be there. So, 1 gram of fuel when heated for 1 hour around 105 degree Celsius then the weight loss is expressed in terms of percentage moisture. Another important constituent is the ash we will note as ash and ash in fact is the residue after complete combustion in the furnace. That means, again we take here 1 gram of the fuel and the fuel is completely incinerated and the residue which is left is expressed in terms of percentage of ash. Third constituent determined is volatile matter. In short, we will put Vm. Now, volatile matter is in fact loss in weight of 1 gram of sample heated for 7 minutes at 950 degree Celsius in the absence of air. I repeat once again volatile matter is a loss in weight of 1 gram of sample heated for 7 minutes at 950 degree Celsius in the absence of air. Now, this volatile matter it does not include moisture. So, remember while determining the volatile matter moisture in the fuel has to be subtracted. So, that is how the volatile matter is determined the fixed carbon fixed carbon in fact that is equal to is determined by 100 minus percentage moisture plus percentage ash plus percentage volatile matter. So, that is how the fixed carbon is obtained. Now, this proximate analysis of the fuel 
or of the solid fuel it can be reported in several ways. Now the basis of report basis of report the one way is that as received one way is as received. Now in the as received condition the approximate analysis of fuel will consist of percentage moisture plus percentage ash plus percentage volatile matter plus percentage fixed carbon. Another way of reporting approximate analysis is on the dry basis. And this dry basis is also called moist free basis. And proximate analysis on dry basis contains percentage ash plus percentage volatile matter plus percentage fixed carbon. Remember the total of all the constituent should be equal to 100. So, on dry basis percentage ash on dry basis it can be calculated upon 100 into percentage ash upon 100 minus percentage moisture that will be percentage ash on dry basis. Now, similarly percentage volatile matter on dry basis that will be equal to 100 into percentage volatile matter upon 100 minus percentage m and then fixed carbon accordingly will be equal to 100 into percentage fixed carbon upon 100 minus percentage m. So, in fact, fixed carbon can also be determined by subtracting the percentage ash on dry basis plus percentage volatile matter on dry basis from 100, you will get the fixed carbon on dry basis. Now, another method of reporting is dry ash free basis. Dry ash free basis. In short, it is also called D A F basis. That means, dry ash free basis and under dry ash free basis, the proximate analysis consists of volatile matter in percent and fixed carbon. So, the percentage volatile matter on D A F basis that will be equal to 100 into percentage volatile matter upon 100 minus percentage moisture plus percentage ash that will determine the percentage volatile matter on dry ash free basis. Now, percentage free carbon on dry ash free basis that will be either you can determine 100 minus percentage volatile matter on dry basis or it can also be determined by 100 into percentage fixed carbon upon 100 minus percent m plus percent a. So, that is how one can report the proximate analysis on different basis. Now, the whole idea of reporting the proximate analysis on different basis it depends upon what is the ultimate use of the coal for the any objective. Let me illustrate by an example. So, consider the proximate analysis of subbituminous coal. So, consider proximate analysis of 
सब ब्यूटिमिनस कोल से परसेंटेज मॉइस्चर परसेंटेज एश परसेंटेज वोलेटाइल मेटर एंड परसेंटेज फिक्स कार्बन एज रिसीव्ड एज रिसीव्ड द एनालिसिस इज 6.8 परसेंट मॉइस्चर 12.3 परसेंट एश 36.7 परसेंट वोलेटाइल मेटर एंड 44.2 परसेंट फिक्स कार्बन and the total should always be 100 percent. Now, suppose if we want to calculate on dry basis, say we want to report proximate analysis on dry basis as I suggested the formula earlier, then percent H on dry basis will be 13.2, volatile matter will be 13.4 and fixed carbon will be 47.4 and this makes again 100 percent. So, whatever basis you choose, the sum total of all constituents should be equal to 100 percent. Now, suppose we want to calculate on dry ash free basis, in short it is called D A F basis or sometimes it is also written D A F basis. So, if you want to calculate on that, then the volatile meter becomes 45.4 percent and percentage fixed carbon becomes 54.6 percent and the total again becomes 100 percent. So, that is how you can report the approximate analysis in different forms dry basis, dry ash free basis. Now, just I want to tell something on a note on ash and volatile matter. Ash and volatile matter, you know coal does not contain ash, coal in fact contains mineral matter and ash is residue after complete incineration of coal. That means, ash and mineral matter are not identical. In fact, mineral matter is greater than ash. So, the important point to remember is that ash is not a constituent of coal, but it is formed on complete incineration of coal. As said the mineral matter which are present in coal, they are of two types. One is the inherent, inherent inorganic material of original vegetable substances, because coal is a plant origin and plant contains organic as well as inorganic matter. Another type of mineral matter that are present that are extraneous in nature, that are extraneous in nature and extraneous could be say rock and dirt during mining operation because when coal is brought down from the earth crust then it is subjected to mining and along with some rock and dirt they are also mixed so they also constitute the part of the ash. Then also extraneous metal they are associated they are also associated with decaying vegetables. and they are intimately mixed. So, in fact, the extraneous mineral matter, they can, I mean extraneous type of mineral matter can be 
removed by cold washing. So, what is important message that I want to give here that mineral matter and ash are not identical and some formulas are available which can determine mineral matter. So, in fact, mineral matter in coal that is equal to 1.1 times percentage ash plus 0.55 percent sulfur. So, that is how from the given analysis of ash and sulfur one can determine the mineral matter. Now, a ash is a very important component of the coal because it is formed during complete incineration of the coal. So, whatever ash is present in the coal the same will be available in the furnace when coal is combusted for deriving thermal energy. So, from that point of view the ash is very important. Now, let us see what the ash contained. Ash in fact, it comprises of SiO2, Al2O3, then it may have ferric oxides, then calcium oxide, magnesium oxide, Na2O, all may uh, ash may be comprised of all these uh, compounds. Now, for metallurgical applications, ash is very important because whatever the amount of ash that is present in the coal that will be transferred on combustion into a combustion appliance for example, furnace or if it is used in some metallurgical function. Now, for example, the coal is used to convert coke and coke is used in the blast furnace for iron making. So, here whatever ash content in the coal is the same amount of ash will be transferred into the coke. So, if you have higher amount of ash in the coal then coke will also contain higher amount of ash. What will happen? If that coke is used in the blast furnace then ash has to be removed and in the blast furnace ash is removed in the form of slag. So, higher amount of ash in the coke which is due to higher amount of ash in the coal the volume of slag in the furnace will also be larger. There are several applications for example, reduction of iron ore in corex process there also whatever amount of ash in the coal that is released during combustion. Another example for example, for another example is say the rotary kilns are used for cement production and directly reduce iron and another important feature of ash is, is, is the melting point. Melting point of ash. Now, the melting point of ash is again a very important thing. The melting point of ash should be greater than operating temperature of the furnace. In that case, ash will be in the solid form and the removal is easier. Now, if the melting point of ash is smaller than the operating temperature of the furnace, in that case what will happen? Ash will be molten and uh, it contains all high refractory oxide SiO2, Al2O3 and so on. What will it do? It will be highly viscous and it may choke the passage of air. Now, another issue is that of volatile matter. Volatile matter. Now, important thing in volatile matter, volatile matter does not contain moisture. Volatile matter does not contain moisture. So, the volatile matter it does not contain the moisture, but it contains the water which is found due to chemical reaction between hydrogen and oxygen. Now, when volatile matter is reported on dry ash free basis, then volatile matter it also contain the contribution of volatiles of the mineral matter, because the mineral matter mineral matter for example, there could be calcium carbonate, magnesium carbonate or hydroxides. So, as such 
when a coal is subjected for volatile matter determination, then the volatile constituents of these mineral matter CO2 or H2O will also be counted in determination of volatile matter. So, actual volatile matter can be obtained by subtracting the volatile matter with the volatile of mineral matter. So, accordingly the actual volatile matter can be obtained by calculating the proximate analysis on dry mineral matter free basis. So, dry mineral matter dry mineral matter free basis. Now, in the dry mineral matter free basis, we subtract the contribution of volatiles of mineral matter and then we report on the dry mineral matter free basis as follows. So, we calculate then percentage volatile matter on dry mineral matter free basis that is equal to 100 into volatile matter minus 0.1 percent A. Now, this 0.1 percent A is estimated to be contribution of volatiles from mineral matter that is where the 0.1 percent a is the ash divide by 100 minus 1.1 percent A plus 0.55 percent sulfur plus percentage moisture. That is how we will be reporting percentage volatile matter on dry mineral matter free basis. Similarly, we can also report then percentage fixed carbon on dry mineral matter free basis that will be equal to 100 into percentage fixed carbon upon 100 minus 1.1 percent A plus 0.55 percent sulfur plus percentage M. So, that is how one can report the, the proximate analysis on dry mineral matter free basis in order to know what is the actual volatile matter which is coming from the coal. So, now the same example which I took in that example percentage sulfur was equal to 0. So, we can calculate now the percentage volatile matter on dry mineral matter free basis that will be equal to 100 into 36.7 minus 0 0.1 into 12.3 that is that upon 100 minus 1.1 into 12.3 plus 6.8. So, if you solve this thing will be coming equal to 44.52 percent is the volatile matter, actual volatile matter. Then similarly, percentage fixed carbon that will be equal to 100 into 44.2 upon 100 minus 1.1 into 12.3 plus 6.8. So, that will be equal to 100 into 44.2 upon 79.67. So, that is equal to 55.48 percent. Now, what this calculation says that percentage volatile matter on dry mineral matter free basis, percentage volatile matter on dry mineral matter free basis is smaller than percentage volatile matter on dry ash free basis. Now, this is obvious because in the dry ash free basis the contribution of volatile from mineral matter is also there that is where 
the percentage volatile matter on dry ash free basis was greater then percentage volatile matter on dry mineral matter free basis because in dry mineral matter free basis we are reducing the amount of volatiles which are coming from mineral matter. Now similarly the percentage fixed carbon on dry mineral matter free basis is greater than percentage fixed carbon on dry ash free basis that you can see also from this analysis. Now why it is so? Because fixed carbon it does not include the ash content that is why the percentage fixed carbon on dry mineral matter free basis is greater than percentage fixed carbon on dry ash free basis. So that is about the proximate analysis. Now next thing is the ultimate analysis. Ultimate analysis. Now in fact ultimate analysis is required for all combustion calculation. Based on the proximate analysis if you want to calculate how much amount of air is required for a given composition of coal you cannot calculate. So in order to calculate the amount of air or amount of energy that the coal has you have to know what is the elemental analysis of the coal and this elemental analysis of coal in fact is termed ultimate analysis. Now in the ultimate analysis carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, sulphur they are determined and reported on dry basis. Then ash percentage moisture they are determined from the proximate analysis. Then percent O percent O is determined from 100 minus percentage carbon plus percentage hydrogen plus percentage nitrogen plus percentage sulphur plus percentage ash that is how you determine the percentage oxygen. So the ultimate analysis complete ultimate analysis will consist of carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, sulphur, O, ash and moisture. This is how the ultimate analysis of a coal consists of. Now say carbon, carbon is determined by completely combusting the coal, collecting the amount of CO2 and it is absorbed in QOH, KOH solution and that is how carbon from carbon from the absorption reading the carbon is determined. Hydrogen is determined together with carbon by completely combustion and whatever amount of water that is produced from that the calculation of hydrogen in the coal is determined. Of course, you have to subtract the correction for moisture of coal and water of dehydration of minerals so that is important. Now in this relation I have to say that carbon content it rather determines the rank of the coal. As you noted in the previous lecture that as you go from pit to anthracite the carbon content of the coal increases that means the rank of the coal increases. So the carbon content determines the rank of the coal as regards the hydrogen, hydrogen it does not determine the rank of the coal that means hydrogen content is not related with the rank of the coal as you have seen also in the last lecture beyond bituminous stage hydrogen content drastically decreases from 5 percent to as low as 1.2 percent in the anthracite. So hydrogen content in fact has no relation with the rank of the coal. Now as regards sulphur, now sulphur in the coal is present as pyritic 
means for example FeS2 pyritic sulfur then it is also present in the form of sulfates then it is also present in the form of organic. Ultimate analysis reports organic sulfur let me write down ultimate analysis reports organic sulfur. In bomb method total sulfur is converted into sulphate form then pyritic and sulphate sulfur are determined by analytical methods and organic sulfur and organic sulfur that is equal to total sulfur minus inorganic sulfur. Sulfur content of the coal is again very important because it will also determine the so called on complete combustion the amount of SO2 that is produced amount of SO3 that are being produced. So, in that connection sulphur content of the coal is a very important. Now, sulphur content has no relation again with the rank of the coal. So, if you want to know the detailed how the analysis is done you can consult a book which is a Sarkar for detailed reference that is fuels and combustion. fuels and combustion, Orient Longman year 1974 there you can find the details about uh, details about uh, this uh, how this analysis is done. Now again the basis of report of ultimate analysis is very important because for all combustion calculation you have to very clear what basis has been given in a particular problem for combustion calculation. So, let me illustrate the different basis of reporting ultimate analysis. Now, let me give an example. I take moist basis moist basis or you can call as received analysis. Now, here it is carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, sulfur, ash and M. Now, let us take an example. So, here carbon 69.8 percent, hydrogen 4.6 percent, oxygen 8.5 percent, nitrogen 1.4 percent, sulfur 2.5 percent, ash 8.7 percent and moisture 4.5 percent. Again the important total should become equal to 100.00 percent that is the most important total should always be 100 percent. Now, the moisture of the coal the moisture of the coal M it contains H2O right. So, percentage H percent H in H2O that will be equal to percent moisture into 2 upon 18. Similarly, percent O in H2O that will be equal to percent m into 16 by 18. So, what I can do now the moisture which I have written here on moist basis that is 4.2 percent I can calculate the h and o contained in this moisture and I can further report ultimate analysis by telling that this is on the moist basis. So, another way of reporting ultimate analysis on moist basis is carbon will remain as 69.8 percent, hydrogen will be 4.6 plus 4.5 into 2 by 18. 
oxygen will be 8.5 plus 4.5 into 16 by 18. Rest nitrogen will remain 1.4, sulfur will remain 2.5, H will be 8.7. So, this total again has to become 100 percent and it is. So, this comes out to be equal to 5.1 and this comes out to equal to 12.5. So, what I wanted to illustrate from here that ultimate analysis on moist basis it can be reported in two ways, but in the second way which I written here moist basis I will put it moist basis A in that I have to write that the moisture content of the coal is 4.5 percent. Now, if I want to calculate now the prox the ultimate analysis on dry basis. If I want to calculate ultimate analysis on dry basis and what I will I do say percent element on dry basis that will be equal to 100 into percent element on moist basis divide by 100 minus percentage moisture. So, if I do that I multiply each carbon hydrogen oxygen and recalculate the proxim the ultimate analysis on dry basis that comes carbon 73.1 percent, hydrogen 4.8 percent oxygen 8.9 percent, nitrogen 1.5 percent, here it is 2.6 percent and ash is 9.1 percent and this sum again become equal to 100 percent. So, what message that I want to give through this analysis that ultimate analysis as well as proximate analysis it can be reported on different basis. So, while converting from one basis to another basis one should be careful particularly for ultimate analysis. So, let us take another part of characterization of fuel that is the calorific value that is the calorific value. Calorific value of coal is the amount of heat liberated on complete combustion at the reference state of products of combustion. That means, you take 1 kg of coal or 1 gram of coal or per unit of coal on complete combustion the amount of energy that is released or that is obtained at the state of the products of combustion is the calorific value of the fuel. Now, for a hydrocarbon fuel for a hydrocarbon fuel which contains for example, carbon, hydrogen and sulphur. Let me tell you here also that in a coal there are combustible component and there are incombustible component. The combustible component of coal are carbon, hydrogen and sulphur whereas, non combustible component of coal are oxygen, nitrogen, ash and moisture. So, for determination of calorific value of the coal we have to consider the components which are combustible and as such the combustible component are carbon, hydrogen and sulphur. Now, the products of complete combustion if I write products of complete combustion products of complete combustion the put as P O C say carbon is C O 2, H is H 2 O and sulphur is S O 2. Now, say reference state reference state of this P O C for example, reference state is a 25 degree Celsius which carbon dioxide C O 2 is gaseous state S O 2 
gaseous state H2O is liquid state. So, in that case this is called gross calorific value. In some books it is also called higher heating value. Reference state chosen then I have CO2 gaseous state, SO2 gaseous state, but H2O will be in the vapor state and in this particular case this is called net calorific value or in short N C V. It is also called in certain books as the lower heating value in short form L H V. So, while using the calorific value of coal one has to be very clear what is the state of products of combustion. Accordingly, the calorific value will differ by an amount equal to latent heat of condensation. So, therefore, the gross calorific value or higher heating value of coal will always be greater than net calorific value of coal or lower heating value of coal because of the latent heat of condensation. Now, calorific value in short I am writing C V which is calorific value it can be expressed as calorie per gram or kilo calorie per kg or kilo joule per kg or BTU per pound or one can also express calorie per gram mole all sort of things you will find in the literature kilo calorie per kg mole or kilo joule per kg mole or BTU per pound mole. BTU is in FPS system which means British thermal units. Now, some conversion factor I am giving here, some conversion factors say 1 cubic feet that is equal to 0 0.02832 meter cube, 1 kilo calorie that is equal to 3.968 British thermal unit that is equal to 4186 joules that is equal to 0 0.00116 kilowatt hour and 1 kilowatt hour that is equal to 1.34 horsepower hour that is equal to 3.6 into 10 to the power 8 joules that is equal to 860 kilo calorie and that is equal to 3412.14 British thermal units. Also 1 horsepower hour that is equal to 0 0.746 kilowatt hour. Now, in all subsequent my lectures I will be using these values as well as the atomic weights values I am giving also atomic weights of some elements for example, hydrogen I will be using as 1 though in some books they refer 1.008 for O I will be using 16 for sulfur I will be using 32 for nitrogen I will be using as 14. The composition of dry air 
in all my subsequent lecture till the end of this course the composition of dry air I will be using 79 percent nitrogen plus 21 percent oxygen this is on volume basis. On weight basis 77 percent nitrogen plus 23 percent oxygen this is on the weight basis. So, these are some of the compositions then I will be using it. Now, this calorific value it can be determined experimentally or by theoretical consideration. Now, in an experiment rather in the laboratory a bomb calorimeter is used. In the bomb calorimeter a unit mass of coal is completely combusted at constant volume and the rise in temperature of the water is noted and from the rise in temperature of water calorific value of coal is calculated. Now, mind you in this calculation we are calculating calorific value of coal at constant volume because that coal is combusted at constant volume. Now, if you want to go for further details on this you can consider the book for example, Sarkar the reference I already given which is I give once again fuel and combustion orient longman 1974. So, if you want to determine theoretically the theoretically calorific value of the coal can be determined from the heat of formation of products of combustion. So, let us take it the products of combustion CO2 gaseous its heat of formation that is equal to 97.2 into 10 to the power 3 kilo calorie per kg mole. Now, these values are at 25 degree Celsius and 1 atmospheric pressure all the values which I am listing they are at 25 degree Celsius and 1 atmospheric pressure. Now, in this heat of formation of CO2 the carbon is in amorphous state. If carbon is not in the amorphous state then its value is slightly different. Similarly, products of combustion H2O is in the liquid minus delta H naught F that is equal to 68.32 into 10 to the power 3 kilo calorie per kg mole H2O vapor minus delta H naught F that is equal to 57.80 into 10 to the power 3 SO2 gas minus delta H naught F that is equal to 70.96 into 10 to the power 3 kilo calorie per kg mole at 1 atmospheric pressure and 298 Kelvin. Now, what I do now I find out say 1 kg of carbon 1 kg carbon on complete combustion will yield 8.1 into 10 to the power 3 kilo calorie. Similarly, 1 kg hydrogen will yield on complete combustion 34.16 into 10 to the power 3 kilo calorie at 25 degree Celsius and 1 atmospheric pressure. Similarly, 1 kg sulfur will yield 2.24 into 10 to the power 3 kilo calorie at 25 degree Celsius and 1 atmospheric pressure. Now, if I want to express this value in terms of percent L element and I say that the calorific value of the coal is the sum of combustible component of the coal and if I add them together and express it in terms of percentage then I get the following formula the gross calorific value that is equal to 81 percent carbon plus 341 percent hydrogen minus percentage oxygen 
upon 8 plus 22 percent sulfur and that is the kilo calorie per kg. Similarly, NCV that is equal to GCV minus 5.84 9 percent H plus percent moisture on kilo calorie per kg. Now, similarly GCV when I want to express in kilo joule per kg then GCV is 339 percentage carbon plus 1427 percent hydrogen minus percent O upon 8 plus 92 percent sulphur. Now, the units are kilo joule per kg. Similarly, then NCV that will be equal to GCV minus 24.44 9 percent H plus percent M. Now, in the expression 9 percent H is coming, the H content of coal is equivalent to moisture that has been written here, because directly you have to substitute the value of H and M. So, the units also here are kilo joule per kg. Now, certain assumptions that are made in the formula, certain assumptions that are made in the formula, first of all heat of formation of coal is 0 heat of formation of coal is 0. That means, we are we have not considered in calculation of the calorific value the bonds which will be broken and the amount of heat that is required. What we have considered in the calculation or in deriving the formula is that the elements are present in free state number 1. Number 2, you know coal it contains hydrogen and oxygen also. The calorific value determines what part of hydrogen has reacted with the gaseous oxygen. So, accordingly there will be reaction between H and O of the coal internally and accordingly the H2O will form. So, one has to subtract the O equivalent of H that means, the available hydrogen for reacting with gaseous oxygen that will be the available gaseous hydrogen available gaseous hydrogen for combustion. O2 of air that is equal to percent H minus percent O by 8 and that is where this percent H minus percent O by 8 has been available. Third assumption is that calorific value of coal is some total of the combustible elements. Number 4 heat of vaporization of water, heat of vaporization of water at 100 degree Celsius that is equal to 542 kilo calorie per kg equal to 975 BTU per pound, whereas at 25 degree Celsius these values are 584 kilo calorie per kg or 1050 BTU per pound. And this formula which I wrote on here they are called the Dulong formula 
Dulong formula for calculation of the calorific value of coal.